There we go. All right, so this stuff is for granted. We're all cardiologists. We all know what we're doing. This is the smart room. And basically, um, I had to get that in because I had a snide joke about cardiologists when I was doing vascular talk a little while ago, so I just had to even it out. Sorry. No offense to everybody. So um, Goldman in the 70s uh, came out with this thing we now take for granted. It was in the New England Journal. And he basically um, looked at things we take for granted, like an S3, uh, recent MI, severe aortic stenosis, bad medical conditions, and basically showed that these um, correlated very nicely with not surviving the surgery. And he put a point value on each one of them, and the higher the point value, the, the less likely you were to survive. This is actually very important, and in fact, uh, you know, when I was a, a house staff years ago, I had the Wash U manual clunked into my pocket, and they actually had this original piece of paper in my Wash U manual when I was rotating through. Um, so a careful uh, history and physical is very important when you look at a patient to try and figure out what their cardiovascular risk is. And you want to figure out what their exercise capacity is. And we'll roll it all together in a few minutes. Obviously, active conditions are more important than ones that happened years ago. Type of surgery involved, low versus high risk, and the urgency of the surgery. For instance, if you have an abdominal crisis, you should probably go straight to surgery rather than dilly-dally around. Um, other things that are helpful too, a creatinine greater than 2 is an independent risk factor for complications after a non-cardiac surgery, as well as uh, abnormal uh, lab work like hematocrits. Hematocrits less than 28 are associated with an increased incidence of preoperative ischemia in patients undergoing vascular and prostate surgery. You have to be careful though then to assume that, oh, therefore I should transfuse the patient before the surgery. That's not necessarily the case. It's just an observation. Whoops. Um, so we used to have low intermediate and high risk surgeries. Now we've, made, we've dumbed it down even more. Now we've got low risk where your risk of MACE is less than 1%, like if you have a breast biopsy or cataract surgery, or elevated procedure risk, MACE greater than or equal to 1%. And the recommendations for the intermediate and high risk procedures are now similar according to the new guidelines. So now while I'm blithering on, you guys should all, if you're not already surfing the uh, internet to check out the uh, baseball scores, um, you should go to http www.surgicalriskcalculator.com. You can, uh, um, that is the website where you can download these uh, risk calculators. And they actually are pretty good. Um, I tried them a few times before this talk. I downloaded it successfully on my phone and it did work. So, um, you know, the revised cardiac risk index has been around forever and it's, it's actually pretty darn good. Um, but because I was also giving this talk in vascular just a few minutes ago, um, I told everybody in general, uh, you should uh, instead download the Vascular Study Group of New England Cardiac Risk Index, because that gives you a more adequate portrayal, and not so rosy, of uh, what's really going on, because the Revised Cardiac Risk Index underestimates the cardiovascular risk uh, severity in vascular patients. Um, so functional capacity, excellent functional capacity if your patient uh, plays singles tennis or plays football or full court basketball. Um, I don't have a lot of patients with excellent functional capacity, but I have a few. Um, moderate, uh, as you can climb up a flight of stairs, you can walk up a hill, you can golf without a caddy. I could argue in Texas that would be strenuous, but here we'll call it moderate. Um, poor is uh, if your patient tells you, well, yeah, I, I get exercise every week. I go out and golf with my buddies in a golf cart. That actually is low risk. Grandma says it's Saturday and I go baking. That doesn't count. So ballroom dancing doesn't count. Those are poor metabolic equivalents. Um, this is the noisiest slide, um, but um, I think most of this you already know. So the first box says, okay, you're going to have a surgery. So if it's an emergency, you hang a right and you go have your surgery. The second one says, are you having an acute coronary syndrome at this moment? If so, please follow the ACCHA guidelines and fix your acute coronary syndrome. I think you would know that. The next one is, okay, now what the heck? Well, now you have to estimate the, the preoperative risk of MACE based on a, a bunch of combined clinical endpoints. So if you downloaded that, uh, that uh, calculator that I told you about, and let's say the patient's having a vascular surgery for the sake of argument, if you add somebody who is, let's say, 70, no cardiovascular risk whatsoever that you could find, never smoked, had normal EF, never had an MI, their MACE rate would still be pretty high. So if you're going to undergo a vascular surgery, almost always you're going to have an elevated cardiovascular risk. Uh, but for surgeries in general, and we're talking about uh, preoperative clearance in general here, if you're low risk, you could just go to surgery without any further testing. Um, but it, in almost all these cases, you're going to be at some elevated risk. And if that's the case, 
It depends on your functional capacity. And this is where you get into the touchy-feely part of this, because if you have um, uh, very good functional capacity, you have greater than 10 mets, it's a 2A indication to proceed immediately to surgery. If you are at, if you're moderate, you know, uh, moderate to good, four to nine mets, um, you can climb up a flight of stairs or walk a flight of stairs. You can justify doing no further testing based on what's going on. It's a 2B. Now, if you cannot determine what the person's functional capacity is um, or it's poor, then if it's going to change your management, you should do a stress test, and that's 2A. So um, if uh, in the vascular world somebody's got claudication, it's been going on for years, and it's gotten progressively worse, and they show up in your office and they want to have something done, you're going to end up having to do a non-invasive stress test on them because their functional capacity is poor. And then based on that finding, then you would see what you needed to do. Um, now the beta, beta blocker saga. So back in the 90s, um, there were these reports coming out about how good beta blockers were. And so here's a, a guy named Mangano who looked at a couple hundred patients and gave patients a tenolol and basically followed them for a couple years. And basically, uh, there was a mortality benefit in the six months after hospital discharge, one year and two years, and the benefit was due to a decrease in cardiovascular mortality. Polderman's followed that with the decrease one study, and he looked at Bisoprolol, which is more beta selective. Um, he looked at 112 high-risk patients um, that had abnormal dobutamine stress echoes, and he gave them Bisoprolol. And the endpoint was death or non-fatal MI at 30 days. And his data was almost too good to be true. It was 3.4% in those receiving beta blockers and 33.9% in those receiving placebo. Um, papers like this resulted in editorials coming out like healthcare is so expensive, everybody should just be on a beta blocker. And probably it, um, in the vast majority of cases, you don't even need to do stress tests on these people because if you get a beta blocker, you're essentially going to live forever. And of course, there are mechanisms why beta blockers are good. I like beta blockers. Beta blockers are my friend. I use them all the time. They decrease myocardial oxygen consumption. They, de uh, they suppress lipolysis, apparently, increase stability of coronary artery plaques, and change ventricular fibrillation. So when you have these uh, very tiny trials that are encouraging, what do you do? Well, you do a larger randomized study to back it up. So they looked at over 8,000 patients with a poise, and they they picked metoprolol succinate, which isn't quite as uh, beta-1 selective, but nevertheless, they gave them a big dose. They gave them 100 milligrams two to four hours before surgery and then six hours after surgery, then 200 milligrams a day for 30 days unless the heart rate is less than 50 or systolic less than 100. So what would that mean? That would mean your 80-year-old grandma is going to have hip surgery, and she's got a heart rate of 51 and systolic of 101, and if you believe the protocol, they got 100 milligrams instead of metoprolol succinate, and then they went to the operating room, to use a kind of an extreme example. Um, and of course, they looked at a primary endpoint, death, arrest, non-fatal MI. It was reduced with beta blockers, mainly due to decreasing non-fatal MI, because I think pretty uniformly it does decrease, you know, uh, CKMB bumps. The 30-day uh, mortality was higher, as well as stroke, hypotension, and bradycardia. So then the other shoe drops. Then Polderman's accused of academic misconduct. Several of his beta blocker trials were brought into question. So then they said, oh, now wait a minute. What do we do now? What if we get rid of Polderman's data, which is a lot of data, and we look at all the patients that we have and we figure out where we are in this whole beta, beta blocker saga? And this is what these guys had to do when they uh, did the guidelines. So this is a meta-analysis, nine secure trials, 10,000 patients. They got rid of Polderman's data, decrease one, decrease four. And in the secure trials, there was a decrease in MI, but there was an increase in hypotension, stroke, and a 27% increase in mortality. So now this is a kind of tiny worded slide so you can have your, op your uh, optometry exam while you're doing this cardiology lecture. But up on top, uh, class one, if you're on a beta blocker, you should continue it. In class three, beta blocker harm, beta blocker therapy should not be started on the day of surgery. And that's primarily from uh, the POISE trial. In class two, you can read all those and it says, well, maybe you could start a beta blocker, maybe you could slowly titrate it up, maybe it's better if you got a lot of risk factors and maybe if you don't have any problems with it. But basically, beta blocker therapy should be individualized. And that's, 
that is a way of saying that nobody really knows and you need to do more studies. So without the decreased studies, there was insufficient data on beta blockades started two or more days before surgery. Although poised to use a high dose of beta blockers, smaller studies had the same signal. Similar signal of increased stroke, hypotension, and bradycardia. So they need more randomized controlled trials to reevaluate the use of beta blockers started several days prior to surgery, preferably with more selective beta blockade like atenolol or bisoprolol rather than metoprolol. Um, stenting, doing PCIs, to just get through uh, a non-cardiac surgery is usually not indicated. It's probably, it's almost never indicated except for a small subset of very high-risk patients. And the timing and the urgency of the non-cardiac procedure is balanced against the stability of the coronary artery plaque. One of the first papers came out here was years ago by Kaluza and Reisner that looked at these patients that had aneurysm resection. And the idea back then was that, okay, they have coronary disease, we're going to stent them, then they're not going to have any problem when they go to surgery. Oddly, the opposite was true. There were a lot of MIs, there were a lot of bleeding episodes, and there were a lot of deaths. And so rather than just bury the bodies, they actually wrote it up, which I think was a great idea. And they said you should delay surgery after elective stenting because this is, a, this is clearly a red flag. So this is a very wordy, wordy, wordy slide that we all know. Uh, but basically, before, uh, when you talk about drug-eluting stents now, you should be, make sure that the patient is going to take their uh, dual antiplatelet therapy regularly. Um, if, if you're going to plan a procedure before somebody has an invasive or surgical procedure um, within the next 12 months, you should give consideration of either delaying the surgery or putting in a bare metal stent. Um, obviously, you talk to the patient about doing their dual antiplatelet therapy and remind them that uh, other doctors should not stop the dual antiplatelet therapy for risk of potentially catastrophic outcomes. Elective procedures for which there is significant risk should be delayed, and we're going to talk a little more about this in a second. Um, there are people here on the panel who are well aware that a couple of small studies have come out where after th three months of dual antiplatelet therapy, patients have been able to go to surgery, but I'm just telling you where we are right now. Um, but then um, uh, timing of elective non-cardiac surgery in a patient with previous MI. So um, the, the most recent guidelines in September 2014, a 2B indication now is elective non-cardiac surgery after DS implantation may be considered after 180 days if the risk of further delay is greater than the expected risk of ischemia and stem thrombosis. Um, and elective non-cardiac surgery should not be performed within 30 days after bare metal stents or 12 months after DS in patients in whom dual antiplatelet therapy will need to be discontinued perioperatively. Elective non-cardiac surgery should not be performed within two weeks of balloon angioplasty either. Uh, aortic stenosis. So you can operate on people with severe aortic stenosis. They might survive if you talk to the anesthesiologist. Now that we have TAVRs, um, you know, obviously, if you could um, uh, get rid of the aortic stenosis first, that might make sense if uh, that was a symptomatic problem in the first place. Um, mitral stenosis, usually less of a deal than aortic stenosis, but you can also um, make it through. Same thing for AI and MR. For HCM, remember, avoid anemia. Um, assessment of LV function, if you have heart failure, do an echo. Prior heart failure, reasonable to do an echo. If they've never had a heart failure, you probably don't need an echo. It's probably always good to do an EKG. So in summary, history and physical help guide appropriate therapy and testing. Functional capacity provides important information. Cardiac risk calculators are available. I hope you downloaded them. Treatment with beta blockers in the preoperative period is individualized. And elective surgery should be postponed a minimum of four to six weeks in patients with bare metal stent and one year with DES. And 65-year-old male, non-diabetic, is going to have cataract surgery, plays double tennis, no cardiac history, normal EKG. What are you going to do, everybody? Colonoscopy, that's right. No, may proceed with cardiac <laughs> surgery. Well said, Neil. All right. 65-year-old male again. Cut and pasted in. Just had a bare metal stent deployed in his LID with a good angiographic result. He awaits knee surgery for arthritis, which is unresponsive medical therapy, greatly affecting his lifestyle. Minimal disease, other vessels, and normal EF. You, he should have immediate surgery, wait four to six weeks, or no surgery. Of course. And currently, the perioperative use of beta blockers should be... Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. John, John you're 40 seconds under time. Uh, <laughs> yesterday, those of us on the faculty received an emergency email from Dr. Lin, who is running the show, uh, instructing us to be controversial. So let me inject a little controversy. John, I yes, counted sir. you mentioned the word guidelines 12 times. <laughs> Guys, 
This is what you do for a living. You're expected to be experts here. My recommendation is that you take the guidelines, print them out, separate the references, so we have two stacks, and then you shred the first stack. You guys are supposed to know this backwards and forwards. This is your lifeblood. So that's my comment about guidelines. You need to know it. This is not cookbook stuff. Guidelines are for people who don't specialize in the fields. Well said. And remember, the guidelines change. So if you look at the guidelines about beta blockers a few years ago uh, versus now, you know, they had all these people walking around the hospital saying, oh my god, that patient's not a beta blocker, they're going to surgery. And now, if you start at the day of surgery, it's a class three indication. So remember that all these things are going to continue to change. Uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, you're going to have to be on dual antiplatelets before an elective surgery for a year before, you know, delaying the surgery. Not clear, right? I mean, I think that the whole thing is evolving. And so in the next several years, it's probably going to change again as we get newer and better stents and other therapies. All right. Thank you.